morning. Today is uh, All Saints Sunday. It's the day in which we remember those who are departed that have been precious to us, that are always precious in God's sight. And uh, in your bulletin, if you picked up one, uh, there's a little slip of paper. I'd invite you to write down the name of those saints that you would like to have us remember in prayers today. A little later in the service, uh, after the hymn of the day, I'll come down and just collect those from you. And uh, we'll share in that way in our service today. Um, and I invite you to stand as you're able. We turn to our order for confession and forgiveness. <coughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake. God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And please join me on uh, hymn number 363. Come, you faithful, raise the strength. Come, you faithful, raise the strength of triumphant gladness. God has brought forth his rival into joy from sadness. Loose from Pharaoh's bitter yoke, make of sons and daughters. Let them with a moistened foot through the Red Sea waters. Is the spring of souls today? Christ has burst his prison, and from three days sleep in death, as a sun has risen. All the winter of our sins, long and dark is lying. From the light to whom we give, God and praise undying. Now the queen of seasons bright with the day of Splendor with the royal feast of peace comes in joy to render, comes to glad Jerusalem, who with true affection welcomes in unwearied strength. 
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. And the Lord be with you. Please turn to your bulletin that we might pray together our prayer of the day. O God, our eternal Redeemer, by the presence of your Spirit, you renew and direct our hearts. Keep always in our mind at the end of all things, and the day of judgment, inspire us for a holy life here, and bring us to the joy of the resurrection, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. reading from Job in the 19th chapter. Oh, that my words were written down. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and with lead they were engraved on a rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Uh, please turn to uh, Psalm number 17 in our hymnal. We read responsibly by whole verses, verses 1 through 9. Psalm 17. Hear a just cause, O Lord, give heed to my cry. Listen to my prayer, which does not come from my lips. Let my vindication come forth from your presence. Let your eyes be fixed on justice. Examine my heart, visit me by night, melt me down. You will find no impurity in me. I have not regarded what others do. At the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My footsteps hold fast to your well-worn path, and my feet do not slip. I call upon you, O God, for you will answer me. Incline your ear to me and hear my words. Show me your marvelous loving kindness, O Savior of those who take refuge at your right hand from those who rise against them. Keep me as an apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. From the wicked who assault me, from my deadly enemies who surround me. The word of the Lord. Amen. From Paul's epistle to the Thessalonians, his second of those epistles, it begins in the second chapter. As to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we beg you, brothers and sisters, do not be quickly shaken in mind or alarm, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as though from us to the effect that the day of the Lord is already here. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the lawless one is revealed, the one destined for destruction. 
He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Do you not remember that I told you these things when I was still with you? But we must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. For this purpose, he called you through our proclamation of the good news so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by our letter. And now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. Word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke in the 20th chapter. I invite you to stand as you're reading. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife, but no children. The man shall marry the widow and raise up children for her brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless, and then the second, and the third married her, and so in the same way all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Those who belong to this age marry, and they're given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore, because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Now he is God, not of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all of them are alive. The gospel of our Lord Jesus. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Welcome, James. How was Evelyn now uh, when you just saw her? I'm going to be ready to release you now, but they ain't, um, they ain't coming under release, release yet, but she's better. Okay, excellent. And let us pray. The Lord, may the words of our mouths, the meditations upon our hearts, be acceptable to you. O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer, Amen. Have you ever given thought to whether you'd want to know what the future beholds for you? Now, that is a mixed bag, if anything. Because if you find out it's something that you really don't want, there's no going back to change that. And if we would make that effort, as movies and scenarios often project that people can time travel, and change things for the good, I don't think that's a possibility. For the ripple effect we might have in making a simple change to that future could affect the entirety of that future. In fact, I've often been asked and asked myself this same question, would I change my life if I could do so and do it any differently? And usually I affirm no. No, I feel pretty good about where I've been. But then I have the disclaimer, not to say that there haven't been a few regrets that I have over some things perhaps said or unsaid, done or left undone deeds, 
And I certainly would like to have that opportunity, as we remember the saints precious to us, to have those I have loved and you have loved to be with us a little bit longer, if we could make that happen. But one of life's lessons that I learned early on what is even the bad things and the ill choices that we may make are lessons to be learned from. And in most of those cases, when I have fallen flat or stumbled and made bad choices, I've been able to benefit from those learning experiences of failure. Another query people often have is wondering what indeed is heaven like. Today in the gospel, we get a little bit of insight into what it perhaps is not, which gives us clues as to what it perhaps is. I will be with those I love. That's most of our hopes. That my pains and difficulties of this life will definitely be at an end, and things will be a bit better. But what will that day-to-day -day life look like when we stand before the throne? we experience the kingdom. Many attempts have been made to give us descriptions of that afterlife. Most notably was that in the Revelation of John, John of Patmos, who uh, pictured it and described heaven in this way. He described it as on all four sides being 1,500 miles long and on height 1,500 miles high. Now, I've been a little away from my math, basic math, to figure out what the, the spatial issue is, but it's billions and billions of square miles. And then he goes on to describe it, that it is made of pure jasper with jewels embedded. It has 12 gates carved from great pearls, streets paved with transparent gold, where there is neither sun by day or moon by night, but the very light comes from God. There is no more crime, no more thirst or hunger, and the heavenly hosts are constantly praising God with their song. Thus define, give a voice, or God will give us a voice so we can make a joyful noise in his presence. Meeting St. Peter at the pearly gate has been the butt of a lot of different jokes, some good and some not so good. So I won't bring those up at this time. But there's that idea that we're held accountable for some things that we've done or not done. The dilemma, though, that we face is that we cannot yet peer into that future of what our life will look like in the heavenly places, either in heaven or even in as close as tomorrow. As a people of faith, we do hold out hope for that promised kingdom. We wanted to give that hope some degree of substance by defining what it is for us. Well, as a people of faith, our source of substance and validation is found in the word of God and the promises that Jesus does not go back on, the promises of our Lord to us. We want to believe that in the afterlife, the good things that we have known in this life will carry on just as they have, and the bad things will suddenly disappear. We hope that we will be reunited with loved ones to know that present sufferings are past. We anticipate a world that will be different, but similar, because that's what's familiar to us. Yet describing that future life in the kingdom is often like trying to describe to a person who is born blind the colors, the colors of the spectrum, what red and green and blue and yellows look like. Well, John describes a vision he received of heaven and does so using images that we might be able to relate to. But again, how does one fully describe the undescribable? C.S. Lewis gave us this little parable of an artist, a female, who had been cast into prison. Her cell was so small, it had one window very high, only to admit light, and nothing for her to see but those walls of that cell. During the time of her imprisonment, 
Shortly after she had been there, she gave birth to a daughter, to a child who became her cellmate. As the child grew, the mother tried her best to describe to her child what the outside world would look like. She spoke of golden fields of white and flowing rivers and fields of multicolored flowers. And the child couldn't relate at all. The woman drew some images in charcoal on dull paper, and that's what the girl described. It's just charcoal and dirty paper. We don't have the perspective of someone who has visited heaven and returned. I kiddingly, when I could with those that I knew on their deathbed and had a good relationship, would often ask the question of them, when you get there, send me a message so I know what we got to face. I wasn't serious about it, but at least rose a little bit of humor for them. Jesus, let's look at what he has to say in this. He has turned his face toward Jerusalem. That is, he has turned to go for the last time to Jerusalem to face what he needed to, his death. Because his death would bring to us, as we know, life and hope and that eternity. We know that in that time, he would face the Roman authorities and he would face the various sects of Judaism. Basically, there were two main groups. The Pharisees believed and accepted the words of the Torah, the teachings of the prophets, and of the writings, and they believed in the resurrection life. However, on the other side of the coin were the Sadducees who believed only in the words of the Torah. They did not believe in the resurrection. So here in that gospel, we have the Sadducees talking about heaven as if it exists to Jesus and asking him questions. It wasn't to get an answer from him. It was to throw him under the bus and keep him and catch him in a trap. They indeed were looking to find a way to be rid of him. I think it's pretty odd that they are the group that raises that question. So, in that text, we have this. We have a woman described as having been married seven times. They don't want an answer from Jesus. They want to just pin something on him. In the process, they ask the question of whose husband will this wife be in the resurrection to eternal life? And here is the answer Jesus gives. Those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age, heaven, the kingdom, and in the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. He gets out of that trap pretty easily. Jesus tells us what it won't be, but he doesn't completely picture for us what it will be. It's much like John's attempt to describe heaven dimensionally, Texturally, colors and materials with the limited language that we have to tell someone about something that is beyond comprehension that no one could put in words. Heaven is something so very different from our ordinary experience. And so that's a part of what Jesus is telling us. We try and imagine heaven from the perspective of our worldly experiences. It doesn't fit. What we have known in this life may not be our experience in the afterlife. That may be disappointing to some people if their life has been pretty flawless and it's just like they want, but it might not be, it might be a little limiting for others. We are comfortable with the known. We are frightened by the unknown. Imagine being able to communicate with a child in the womb. You try and describe the outside world and how life will be for them, only to find that they aren't all that excited about leaving the womb at all, that warm, comfortable environment just yet. But the time will come and does come for birth, and gradually our children acclimate to this new world, a small glimpse of it at a time. And so I think that is our understanding of heaven. Jesus spoke of eternal life in both the now and in the future.
from the 17th chapter of John. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So the first step in that future relationship with God and Christ in heaven is something like this. It's to have a relationship with them now. Knowing God as the only God in one's life and believing in what the Son taught and lived gives us a little bit of a glimpse of heaven. For it is in knowing and believing in God and Christ that leads one to be able to leave the rest in God's hand. Isn't that the journey of faith? To trust and believe. I think it is very easy to get caught up in the details, the particulars of John of Patmos and his description. And maybe that will be the true image of what it is. It seemed to be to him. Early, though, in John's Gospel, in the sixth chapter, Jesus speaks of the now and the future dimension of God's kingdom. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, but now, and I will raise them up at the last day, the future. Again, the now has to do with the glimpse that we are given of a promised life as we live in that relationship with Jesus. Jesus, in one of the Gospels, has the Gospel of the Sermon on the Mount, but he has in another text, the Sermon on the Plain. And in that, he speaks about the reversal of things on earth when we image what heaven is like. Eternal life is living as Jesus did in relationship to others. Forgiveness, sacrifice, thoughts and actions toward others, love of God, love of neighbor, knowing of his presence in one's present time. And our future, our future is to be raised up on the last day to receive one's place in that promised kingdom. That is his assurance. Relationships of family, in marriage and friendships, it's essential to our life in this world. We are impoverished without those friendships and things that we cherish. It gives us a sense of belonging, a sense of fitting, of really mattering to someone in some things. But the things we prize in those relationships will not be essential or necessary in the eternal life. One's relationship with God as we are face to face in his presence with our creator, satisfies those human needs. It is different. We are transformed into the mysterious unknown light that we so want to understand and we want a vision of. So marriage and other relationships are no longer necessary for the needs of intimacy, but they are fulfilled by our intimate relationship. In a new way. Jesus doesn't say that we won't be in the presence of those that we have loved and known in this life. He goes only to so far as to say that things are gonna be different. Paul gives a pretty descri good description of that in a different way in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. What is sown is perishable, this life, and what is raised is imperishable, life. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in the physical body. It is raised in a new spiritual body. A little insight from Paul. And later Paul will say that the resurrection life is a mystery. But still in that mystery he believes so we are called to do the same. There's something fantastical about the mysterious, that which remains aloof and unreachable. One continues to pursue and search and wonder about those mysteries. People like us, though, believers in the Lord Jesus, are compelled to remain connected 
to our only source of entry into that mystery, connected to our Heavenly Father and the Son, our Christ. Paul's words to the Corinthians in the 13th chapter, you've heard it many a time, are spot on when it comes to this. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known, the light of the kingdom. I think we would do well to embrace perhaps the attitude that Martin Luther had in his journey of faith as one who also anticipated the heavenly light when he wrote, I would not give one moment of heaven for all the joys and riches of this world, even if it lasted for thousands and thousands of years. Basically, he's saying to us, don't forsake the moments that we have to live as Christ would have us to be, for that is a part of the kingdom life. And what will be, will be, and it will be.
confess our faith, you share the words of the Apostles' Creed, you can find that on page 127 or 115 or in the back of the hymnal, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us pray. O God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, and Jacob and Leah, not content to remain a God of the past, you are our God too, our God of the living. We thank you for our world, its beauty and grandeur, the resources you provide for us, the call you give us to live in harmony with the earth, our fragile home. Bring to repentance, O God, the leaders of our rich countries, those who say the time isn't right to make change, to, to mitigate climate issues, those who continue to find ways of using resources unproductively. Show us how to truly live well, O oh God, that we may turn away from choices that keep the earth unbearably and help us to be better stewards of all you have entrusted to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Show us, Lord Jesus, how to welcome the refugee, those who remain, remind us again and again that you were born as one of us and sought asylum in places far away as a young child. Be of help to all. Help us to be welcoming to each that come within the shelter of this place of worship, that they might find in their hearts, in your word, the truth of life, that it might sustain them for life's journey. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer, O Holy Spirit of fire and righteous anger, burn through our indifferences and willingness to settle for mediocrity in our day-to-day -day living. Give us those things that will help in this world become a better place because we have walked down the pathways you have shown us and we have sought your will for this day and each day. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray, O oh Lord, for peoples across this land we call our home, that they will exercise their right and the privilege of the ballot box. They will vote their good conscience, informed by your will, for all things, and not only what, it, what benefits self alone, but shows our embrace of Jesus' command to love one another and one's neighbor. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray that injustices throughout the world might soon end, and peace will reign above hatred, greed, and war. We pray for the people of Ethiopia who have suffered for decades of war and tribal strife, that the fragile ceasefire wrought this weekend might turn to lasting peace. We pray for the people of the Ukraine as they suffer through continued war, bring a resolve and peace to their land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh Lord, on this day in which we remember fondly those who we have loved and who have loved us. And we pray that we might remember those departed who are precious to us. For Hazel, for JT, for Mike, uh, for Matthew. We pray for those remembered by those gathered here for Jack, for Mary Lee Smith, for Joey, we pray for Bennett Howard and Trey.
Mary Lyles and, and Joe Hughes. I would offer my prayers for my parents, grandparents, and those who have shown me a, a pathway of life that has brought me goodness and mercy and love. And for each that we would remember now in the silence of this moment. Give us confidence to believe in that resurrection to eternal life that you have promised. Lord, in your mercy, we give thanks for the veterans of our armed forces, of Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, Coast Guard, National Guard, who in our stead defend our nation and the cause for peace and harmony between nations and in our own land. We thank you for their service. We pray your blessings will be upon them as they do the difficult work of soldiering and of guarding and protecting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we commend to you those for whom we would intercede on behalf of seeking renewal and healing in their life. For Evelyn Ragg as she is hospitalized, Evelyn Tompkins, for Mary and Martin, for Sarah, Brian, Becky, Tom, and Nikki and Lisa, Nancy and Roger and Hunter, for all others we commend to your healing presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. We greet each other as you're able. God's peace and blessings. for the sharing of our Lord's Supper. We do so inviting all to partake of it. We use uh, intention as our means of communion if you wish to come to the communion rail and kneel and receive the element of uh, bread first. And then if you would hold on to that till I come with the chalice and uh, dip that and uh, then consume. And we also have on the small table by the bolted area there some of the pre-filled glasses if you do not feel comfortable coming up to the rail. Our preparation for the sacrament is, begins in our bulletin as we share together the words of the offertory prayer, and you may stand as you're ready. And we pray together. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your, your care. And prepare us now to feast on the bread of life. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you. Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, by the witness of the saints, you show us the hope of our call. You strengthen us to run the race set before us, that we may delight in your mercy and rejoice with him in glory. And so with all the saints, with the choirs of angels and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. A 
friends, our Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, he took some bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup. When he had supped and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you. It's shed for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together we pray as our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. All is prepared, come and share in his presence. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. Amen. The table is prepared. I invite you to come forth as you are able. We can probably uh, start on this side and uh, pretty much complete that little section. And again, the elements are here for the individual cup with, with wings. and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. our post-communion prayer as we pray together. O oh God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you, to be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What well, sounds like uh, James's good news is that uh, she's 
probably going to leave. Yeah. Uh -huh. Didn't find anything major wrong. Not, no, no. And that's a lot. That's a blessing. But you did the right thing. Oh, yeah. As we get older and these little yeah. bumps happen in the road, you don't know how, how quickly those can turn. That's yeah. why you just stay pretty to the, um, you get to it all right. But um, you better keep your head up and just go. Yeah, yeah. Well, it gave him a chance to give her a little checkup, yeah. too. And that's always good, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my just being back, the trip was good. It was long, longer than I wanted it to be. I missed home, missed our cats, all the common and normal things. It was good to be with family, but we were all over the place. I'm worn out. It took us a while to recoup. Uh, so I, I missed uh, Matthew's celebration. Did it go uh, as you wished it to? Wonderful. And a thank you for everybody who helped support Nancy and Roger and, and Hunter and that. Amen. Good, good. Uh, we're collecting some food goods for uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, and it looks like the, the thing is getting filled up, which is good. Small group, but mighty again, doing wondrous things. And uh, do we, we have our uh, pork barbecue sale coming up. Yeah, and I have um, flyers today for selling the meat that you can sell it a week from this coming Friday. Okay. Um, I put a sign up sheet out for that Friday. If you can come help us on that Friday morning yeah. around 7 o'clock. Because most of our orders go out by 11, and we got people coming in. Yeah. But we need um, people to help us sell. Okay. We really need people to help us sell. I'll be there to help deliver that day um, and whatever is needed. So anything you can help us do, we appreciate. And it's eight dollars for the sandwich. We did not change because of the economy. Yeah. And it's ten dollars a pound. Good. And. Um, if, if people bought roast and all, next Sunday is going to be a, a good enough to get them. Sunday, yeah. I'll bring them. I brought several, so I'll bring those next week. Yeah. Excellent. That's good news. Um, anything? Uh, we're going to wait till the spring for the yard sale. I'm guessing with Miriam and um, a lot of what she had. Yeah, our cows are just doing them quick right now. So what? We have to wait the cows. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll we'll keep them in our prayers. Do they have names? Particular that's a troublesome one. Troublesome. Oh, okay, just troublesome. <laughs> Evelyn, you're feeling a little better? Good. Good, I'm glad to see that. And Rachel, wonderful to see you. It's yeah, grand yeah, to have you be here with us. Good. All right. And Miss Marion sends her love, but she didn't speak to you about that. Ah. She was going to make sure you got the time changes. Uh, Judy was here early. <laughs> she left the bulletins and went home because uh, I guess she the clock didn't quite work for her. Nancy? Oh, I want to thank every person who did that. Help make the day. For Matthew, uh, everyone. I have to thank Ken and Donna. Unbelievable. The food that they picked. Yeah. And um, it couldn't have been done without them. But each person they brought made a huge part of it. I love Wonderful. That's what you want. Some good remembrance, right? And that's what we do today. Find those people who have been precious and shaped your lives, those saints living and saints departing, because we do remember who the saints are. The saints are everyone sitting here. If you look at yourself in the mirror, you are. Luther talked about us of being both saint and sinner at the same time. And uh, that is the human nature indeed. But we are saints not according to what we've done what he has done for us bought us salvation through his death his resurrection and the life eternal that we hope for and makes us right in god's sight and when somebody does that for me or does that for you i think it wants us to be a better person to be that person that the christ is so let that be your effort each day james um nancy um it was a wonderful idea about that five dollars and it came in handy, because I was walking um, at, uh, two days or three years afterward. I met a guy and he said, Mr. Ray, he said, man, I need some food. I ain't got no food. I, I, I don't have it. And I remember about that $5. Ah. <laughs> and like the pastor just finished saying, this is what Jesus wants us to do, to help one another. Yeah. Amen. And, uh, go ahead. Rachel. Do y'all know the old man, Lord, the um, Owen, Owen, Bill 
talking about him? Okay, so well, yeah. yes, and they were still on the Dream Team. Right. Oh. My friend, Chris Nichols, he um, he was helping him do something, and he was going to take something inside of his house, mm -hmm. and he said when he walked into his house, he almost, he almost passed out oh. because of the smell oh. of his house, that it smelled like human feces, yeah. that like something's been going on for like years and years and years and years and years, and that this man has been, and it's just, it's, he, he said his eyes started burning because of um, the ammonia smell. Oh, and that, yeah. okay, so that man, I think he's some, uh, got some mental problems. Um, he stands outside of his house, like, all the time. Anytime I drove past there, he's always standing outside, and that's probably why. Uh, he doesn't have any family around here. Mm. This man's like, probably, what, 60, 70? Yeah. Yeah. No, and I don't know. He's 80. Yeah, he's, right. like, he's older. He's older. Yeah. And I know the neighbors can smell it because Chris Nichols said that they can definitely smell it because once he walked out, he could smell it when he was still in his car. So this man is suffering, suffering tremendously. He is part of this community. And I feel like I should share that with y'all. Maybe pray, we all pray about it yeah. or something. But, or, you know, we can tell the Mormons guys maybe they can help. I don't know. But we, we, we can't. Uh, I can't. Um, you know, go on with knowing all this. Yeah. We got to help him. I think he was trying to help him if he needed time to pass the disease. Okay, so he, he told Chris Nichols that. that he would let him help him. Oh, my yeah? Friend, okay. But he, Chris Nichols cannot do it all the time. No, no. Yeah. Well, if Chris finds out something specific from him that we could do to help that. Maybe they, we could get him away from okay. his house for a little while, for a, a day or something and, and get people in there just to, I mean, well, it's a health hazard at this point. Yeah, you know, I mean, it would be. Yeah. I'm afraid they might, you know, you say something to authorities and his house will be condemned and he'll be out yeah. on the yeah, street. Yeah, we're not That's them. the risk. We, we can't tell them. We just have to pray about it. Everybody Let's see what, where that leads us. He doesn't have none of his family. His family is going to be out. He does that side. Can't wait for something? Because Chris Nichols tried to get in touch with him, but they don't care. that and his name again because I don't know him. Nolan. Nolan. Why don't you lead us in a prayer? Nolan. Or we can do that. That would be the best thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gracious God, open our hearts and our minds to ways that we can be of help and love to Nolan and those who find themselves in life's difficulties. Send to him those angels of mercy that might be of real help and help him to find a better place in his own life to be able to accept the help that people would offer, render unto us some clarity of understanding as to how we might be a part of that. We ask this in Jesus to look over him and over us. In his precious name, amen. And you tell it, Nolan, not yeah. Owen. It, yeah, she's talking about Owen. 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 Yes. Owen. Yes. Yes. That's who I'm talking about. Let's close with our closing hymn, hymn number 435. Um, I'll lead you through in case it's not familiar to us, but it gives some heavenly images and the image of end times. Lo, he comes with clouds descending. Lo, he comes with clouds descending.
Go in peace, love and serve the Lord. And thanks be to God.